Hi, I'm John Prangnell from the University of Queensland and today for my National Archaeology Week talk I'm going to talk about historical archaeology sites and places around the world that have been impacted by the spread of Europeans from Europe that happened about 600 years ago. So that period of colonialism, imperialism and the start of capitalism around the world. So places and objects become archaeological when they move from the cultural system and are no longer used. So in historical archaeological terms, that might be when a town becomes a ghost town. So the people abandon their town and we just get the remains of that town. Or people can deliberately dis dispose of things. They can uh, discard them like we do every day in our garbage. We can cache things and we often hear about Roman coins being found in Britain in caches. Or we can dispose of our dead. So we bury them in cemeteries or we can accidentally lose things. So historical archaeologists tell stories about the past based on finding these kinds of things that have been left behind. And the kind of places that we look at are domestic places like township sites or homesteads. We look at uh, pastoral and uh, rural industries, resource extraction like gold mining or tin mining or uh, timber getting, uh, industrial sites, Sites of uh, military or con and conflict, uh, there's been a recent study in Queensland on the native mounted police and the, uh, some, of the, some of the native mounted police camps in Queensland. We obviously look at convict sites. Contact sites are a specific type of site where uh, Aboriginal people and Europeans came into contact and we get two completely different cultural systems interacting. Uh, resistance sites, these may be contact sites or they may be other sites of resistance. They could be things like uh, uh, strike sites like the uh, 1891 Shearer's strike camp at Barcaldon. Uh, we have maritime sites all up and down the Queensland coast, cemeteries obviously, and then institutions. I myself have a bit of a specialty in terms of health institutions in Queensland and how and how uh, health was managed in the 19th century. But today what I want to do is look at a range of historical archaeological sites from around Queensland and uh, describe some of the things that we found, how we, how we dug the sites and uh, why they're important and the things we found. So the first one I'm going to talk about is the Tower Mill. Uh, most people in Brisbane will know about the Tower Mill. It's up on Wickham Terrace in the, in the city. It's one of two convict period buildings that we have in Brisbane. And it's the site of my very first historical archaeological excavation, uh, something like 30 odd years ago. <laughs> so this picture that we can see here is of Wickham Terrace with the, uh, with the tower mill and the small uh, caretaker's cottage. We can tell that this photo is uh, probably taken in the 1870s or the 1880s by the caretaker's cottage, the wooden fence in front of it and the time ball on the top of the tower. Uh, we did a whole lot of ground penetrating radar and when this study was done that was groundbreaking. Uh, nobody in Queensland had done ground penetrating radar for archaeology before this. And from the, from the ground penetrating radar we identified uh, an area that we thought had anomalies that we could detect. So this photo is of the excavation itself. It's 16 square metres and the photo is taken from the top of the tower mill looking down onto the lawn in front of it. And what really stands out there is a hole. We can see a hole at the top of the excavation in line between the tower mill and the, fl and the current flagpole. And this is what it looks like in uh, profile. So archaeologists draw stratigraphic drawings 
of their excavations so that we can see them in profile. And what we can see is that we found a big hole <laughs> in the ground that was dug sometime out towards the end of the 19th century. And so what, what we think it is, is that it was originally a flagpole hole, but it was too close to the mill. So what we found here was an accident. We found that they'd actually dug, put the original uh, flagpole too close to the tower mill. Uh, these are those stratigraphic units that are in there, and you can see that we found material going all the way back to the convict period. So we had uh, material from the convict period and then through the different stages of the use of the tower mill. More recently, in the, in the last few years, there was some question about whether the treadmill that was attached to the original tower mill was still under Wickham Terrace. So the tower mill was used to, grain, to grind grain, but it was also used as a site of punishment during the convict period. And so convicts would walk on the treadmill. They'd be in their chains and they'd have to walk up and down, hanging onto the treadmill and turn the treadmill for 12 hours at a time. And the treadmill location would have now put it under Wickham Terrace. So we actually did some ground penetrating radar of Wickham Terrace and found this anomaly under Wickham Terrace in line with where the treadmill should be. So one night we stopped the traffic on Wickham Terrace and we dug up the terrace looking for the treadmill. Uh, so we cut through the bitumen and then we excavated uh, through, but unfortunately we didn't find any treadmill. The, uh, the anomalies were uh, water pipes <laughs> under the ground. So hopefully the treadmill is still there. <laughs> we just didn't find it. Okay. The second site I want to talk about takes us out of Brisbane. It takes us north to uh, just uh, in, inland from Maryborough on the Burnett River, the site of Paradise. This is the site of the Paradise Dam, which has been in the media in the last couple of years because of some issues with the dam wall itself. But prior to the construction of the dam, we did a large historical archeological study of the township of Paradise because it was going to be flooded by the dam water. So this is a map showing the uh, Township of Paradise. In the top corner you can see the Burnett River and the words Township. That indicates the uh, location of the township and then you've got a row of hills just behind that down into a gully that runs into a U-shape in the hills. That's called Paradise Gully. The this was a gold mining town. Paradise was established in 1888 and lasted about 10 years, 10 to 15 years before everybody had left and abandoned the town. And they left because the gold had run out. And so the gold mining was uh, deep uh, shaft mining and it was, there were adits or horizontal shafts going in from Paradise Gully under the township, under the Burnett River. This is the only photograph we have of Paradise. It's a, uh, it's, a, it's a composite image. You can see a large building. That's in the background of the image. That is the original courthouse. The colonial government of Queensland actually thought that Paradise was going to turn out to be uh, more substantial and long lasting than it was. And so they actually supplied a number of uh, government facilities at Paradise for the entire region. So there was courthouse, there was police stations, there was post office, there was other facilities. And this was the courthouse. Uh, so there's an insert inset in this uh, photo. It's an oval shape in the middle. It has the word Paradise on it. And that shows the main street of Paradise, Allen Street, uh, running up. And the large building in the background of the smaller uh, inset is the courthouse building. So you can, we're now looking up Allen Street towards that courthouse. It shows you the architecture of the town. It's all timber and tin and a lot of it is sort of made out of what's available locally. This is one of the other few photographs that we have 
of paradise. This is the first police station. And you can see some native mounted police there. This image comes from the uh, police museum and is captioned as blanket distribution at paradise. Uh, I know that this photograph was actually taken at paradise. I've ground truth this photo by standing in that exact position and the hill line behind it is, matches exactly. So we can confirm that this was taken at paradise. This is an image of the Methodist mission. So the Methodists arrived early at Paradise. Uh, Methodist missions, there was uh, what they called uh, the native missions to Aboriginal people, but then they had what they called their home missions to uh, non-Indigenous peoples. And the home mission at Paradise was the first Methodist home mission established in Queensland. The gable-ended building that's facing us, with the, uh, without the, the, the building without the awning is the church, is the Methodist church, and the smaller building with the awning is the residence for the, uh, for the missionary and family. So we surveyed the entire township site. Uh, we worked there for about nine months doing this work and we identified 97 different buildings, mostly houses, based on their, the stone from their fireplaces or the stumps from the buildings. This was a rather large site at the western end of Paradise. So Paradise basically runs between two creeks, Paradise Creek and Finney Creek. And this is at the Finney Creek end, at the western end, and this is the major garbage dump in the town. Although we can't see any artefacts in this picture, that ground surface is completely covered in 19th century artefacts. Another way we had for identifying uh, where buildings were in this town was by the remnant plantings that survived to this day. So introduced species that grew along fence lines and as hedges still grow there today. There was, of course, mining infrastructure at, the, at Paradise. This is a uh, ventilation shaft that goes down about 60 metres down to uh, a horizontal shaft running under the town of Paradise. And this is a mullock heap at the mouth of an adit. So the Paradise Gully is immediately behind that uh, mullock heap. So this is a town plan. This is based on the 1890 town plan of Paradise over the, uh, over the current topographical map. Uh, the Burnett River runs in the S shape. It's the bit without any of the lines in it. That's the Burnett River. And the red is the town plan laid beside the Burnett River. We got exceptionally lucky in doing our surveys of Paradise. We actually found the original surveyors' blazers on the trees marking the, the points on their survey plan. So we were able to geo-reference the, the original town plan by using those uh, original survey blazers. An incredibly fortuitous occurrence. So then we, when we, d we did the survey, we recorded every artifact on the ground surface across Paradise and we were able to plot these on a, on a geographic information system on layers in the GIS to their exact location and which plots, which lots in town they related to. So this is, shows part of the town, shows the school block, shows the, uh, and some of the streets. The uh, dark blue are uh, housing stumps. The, the, purple, the dark purple are post holes where housing stumps were located. So if we zoom into the uh, school area, we can see where the school building was within the school reserve by the holes left from where the posts have rotted away. So on the town plan, we decided to excavate in eight areas. Uh, one of these was a machinery area. One was the police station. Uh, one was the Methodist mission. And the rest were residential uh, areas. So this was the, what the police station was, looked like if you remember, and this is excavating the police station. 
So this is the fireplace of the police station. Uh, and this is my site plan of that. You can see we started with a test pit one in square one, realised we'd actually found some interesting stuff, and so expanded out until we got the whole fireplace. And this is an image of the fireplace. The large rocks in this image are basalt from the, um, from the river and formed the chimney of the fireplace. Inside that we have the brick hearth. In front of that we have uh, bricks that were laid in front of the fireplace and you can see that they are quite worn away. And this is from people standing uh, in front of the fireplace doing their cooking and I guess warming themselves in these cold Queensland winters. One of the most interesting finds we actually found in, at the police station excavation was this pig's head. It's made of uh, metal. It's actually the top of a Vesta case. And a Vesta case held matches. So this was the top of a small, it was hinged top of a small matchbox. At the Methodist Home Mission, this is what it looked like before we started excavating there. You can see uh, grass and a lot of uh, regrowth trees there. This is what it looked like originally, as you'll recall. Uh, this is the Reverend Gardner. He was the first uh, missionary at Paradise. And the horse behind him is named Tom. And we know this from the Reverend Gardner's letters because Tom was going around the country setting a good Christian example. Whoops, I went too fast. Uh, the Paradise Mission, interestingly, had the most expensive and exotic ceramics of anywhere at Paradise. These were the best quality, people were eating off the best quality plates at the Methodist Mission, which seems sort of contradictory to me. But we have uh, an image there of a Wedgwood-like Jasper Ware. I can't com you know, confidently call it Wedgwood, but it looks very much like it. And the other image is of a very elaborate transfer print from the New Wharf Pottery Company, a pattern called Tennyson. And from the registration mark there, we can see that that pattern was registered in 1884. Other kinds of artefacts we found from in Paradise include these uh, ceramic styles, the annular patterns and the transfer print patterns. These were found at the Methodist Mission and at the Buzzer Homestead. And the Buzzer Homestead was 280 metres away on a different slope. So the Buzzer was slopes to the, 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 the land the Buzzer house is on slopes to the west and the land the Methodist Mission on slopes to the north and the east. But these are the, we had a number of artefacts that were only found at these two places, which suggests to me some very close connection between the buzzers and the Methodist missions. It could be, I'm thinking, that maybe the buzzers were supplying food to the Methodist mission. The Reverend Gardner was a single man. He was late, later, later missionaries were married but Reverend Gardner was single, so it's possible that the buzzers were Methodist and were actually uh, supplying the Methodist mission. George Buzzer was a carpenter and actually built the uh, school building in the school reserve. These are some of the other kinds of artefacts that we found at Paradise. You can see their dressmakers pins, lots of the uh, women living in Paradise and half the population of Paradise were women and children. Uh, lots of the women were dressmakers so we found lots of dressmakers pins. We have escutcheons, we have shellfish, we have uh, clock and watch parts, writing slates, lots of cartridge cases, uh, slate pencils, buttons, and in the center, clay pipes. So clay tobacco pipes, these are parts of the bowl where the tobacco would have been put in the bowl. My favorite clay tobacco pipe, and this was found at the, at the home of a person we know to be Methodist. So that was very interesting. This is a, this is a reclining semi-nude woman who is lying along the 
uh, stem of the clay tobacco pipe and is leaning up against the bowl. So a very interesting find. I want to bring us back to Brisbane now to one of the more important excavations that we've ever done in, in Brisbane City. Back in the 2011 floods, many of you will remember the 2011 floods, uh, there was a water main uh, break in William Street during the flooding and it caused a large concrete wall to capsize, collapse, go down the slope from William Street and into the lower levels of the commissariat store. The commissariat store is the other convict built building in Brisbane. And you can see there the large slab of concrete that went down that wall. And you can see, you can see how the uh, wall is completely gone from the site. This is the hole that that piece of concrete put into the wall of the commissariat store. And the um, state government masons have done a great job in restoration and reconstruction of the town, of, of the commissariat store. So this is what it looks like when you take all the concrete and the debris away that fell down that slope. The stone wall behind me, that's me pointing up at the slope, but the stone wall uh, behind the three figures there is part of the original convict built retaining wall. So that built wall was built in 1828. And you can see that uh, where it junctions and some of it comes back towards the uh, fellow in the white hat where the convict wall there has been completely destroyed by the, uh, by the collapsing concrete wall from above it. Okay, so the stonemasons had to take away that part of the convict built wall to be able to rebuild it and put it back. And this is what they found when they took it away. And for me, this is one of the most amazing archaeological finds we've had in Brisbane City. This, was the, this is the original stone that was cut by hand by convicts so that to, to level the ground to build the commissariat store. And you can see the original pick marks in this rock. And we were the first people to see this since the convicts put their retaining wall up in front of it in 1828. So that wall, that, that uh, hand-picked rock is still there behind the new retaining wall that was put, that was rebuilt there. These are a couple of the masons <laughs> who are obviously enjoying the limelight. So what we can see in this image is the face that the concrete wall uh, fell from. And we can see where the base of that wall was. You can see a dog leg in that face about, about two thirds of the way down through the dirt at the same kind of level that the, uh, I don't know what that thing's called that they're standing on. But whatever that thing's called that they're standing on, where the people are standing <laughs> at about that level, you can see a dog leg in the, in the face. And that's the, that was the base of the concrete wall. What had happened was that the convicts had built their retaining wall in 1828 and this was the profile of William Street at the time. You can see the, commissary, you can see the Brisbane River over that side, then you've got the wharf structure, then you've got a two-storey commissariat building. It was, a third storey was added at, at the start of the 20th century. Then you've got the convict built retaining wall and then on the other side of the image, you've got the buildings across William Street. So you can see the slope there is on William Street throughout most of the 19th century. It actually sloped quite steeply down towards the river. So in the 1880s, they put in a wooden wall, another wooden wall above the stone wall built by the convicts. And then in the 1890s, they replaced that with the concrete wall. So the material that came out from behind the concrete wall when it collapsed 
was material that had built up against the wooden wall and the concrete wall uh, in the late 19th century and the fill that they'd put in to level William Street. So, and this is some of the material that we found that came out of that wall. The largest glass unbroken gin bottle I've ever found. <laughs> That's uh, the large green bottle in the corner. Below that is uh, part of a toilet bowl. We found most of a large toilet bowl made by a Scottish company in the 1870s where the transfer printed what was known as a romantic decoration of um, urns and landscape and ferns was actually on the inside of the bowl. Uh, beside, the, um, beside the gin bottle is a, uh, a badge which says PWMU in a, in a large red Q. This stands for the Presbyterian Women's Missionary Union of Queensland and is certainly, for me, one of my favourite finds. Uh, beside that we have a uh, bone toothbrush, a clay tobacco pipe bowl. Beneath the clay tobacco pipe bowl, we have an ink bottle. This is a Siemens ink bottle. So Siemens is a um, telecommunications company. And in the 19th century, they were making uh, printers for Morse code. And this is an ink bottle to use with a Morse code printing machine. Beside that, we have part of a ceramic electric insulator or telegraph insulator. And I thought this was interesting because the commissariat store was the first place in Brisbane where telegraphic communications were sent from. The first telegraph message in, Brisbane, in Queensland was sent from the commissariat store to Ipswich. And then beside that is a large blacking bottle. This one's made by uh, Dalton in London. And blacking is basically shoe polish. Uh, so it's a, a sticky black substance <laughs> that was used as shoe polish. And for the, uh, for the classic scholars amongst us, uh, Charles Dickens, when his father was jailed for um, debt in the early part of the 19th century. His first job when he was 12 years old was working in a blacking factory. Okay, now the last site I want to talk about today is probably the largest project I've ever worked on and this was the redevelopment of Suncorp Stadium. So back at the start of the 20th century, uh, 21st century, <laughs> sorry, back at the start, it was 20 years ago, that's what I was thinking, was th the development of the Suncorp Stadium from the Lang Park, uh, from what was Lang Park into Suncorp Stadium. So this obviously, as you know, is the major football stadium for uh, Brisbane, where the Brisbane Broncos play, where the State of Origins played, where the Brisbane Roar play, and whatever the, Queen, the Brisbane Rugby Union team's called, Queensland, I can't, what are they called? The Reds, where the Reds play, sometimes. So you can see its location in, in relationship to the Brisbane River and to the centre of Brisbane. So the North Brisbane burial grounds underlie Suncorp Stadium. So Brisbane was a convict town from 1825 until 1839. And that, they had a burial ground uh, in, near Skew Street, near Roma Street. But when Brisbane Town was open for free settlement in 1842, they established a cemetery where Suncorp Stadium is now. And there's a very specific reason why the stadium, why, why the cemetery is where it is. And that was the, colon the British Colonial Act of 1824 stated that uh, in the colonies, cemeteries were administered by the colonial authorities, not by the different religious denominations, and that they had to be at least a mile from the centre of town. And Suncorp Stadium is a mile from Brisbane GPO, 1.6 kilometres from the Brisbane GPO. So they put the cemetery as close as they could to the town. And you can see here in my image 
that the North Brisbane burial ground was divided into a number of different denominational cemeteries. So there was an Anglican cemetery, a Presbyterian cemetery, a Roman Catholic cemetery and a Jewish cemetery. And then that takes us between Milton Road and Caxton Street. And then on the other side of Caxton Street was the uh, Congregationalists, the Baptists and the Methodists. So this is an image taken in the, in the second half of the 19th century showing that area. Uh, in the background of the image, you, the hill in the background is Mount Gravatt. In the middle distance, you can see the Brisbane River. Uh, the building up on the hill to the left is the Petrie Terrace Jail. And then uh, between the river and the bushes, we can see a number of cemeteries. We can see that the ground is sloping down towards uh, at the right hand side and uh, so if you remember the 2011 floods and the Suncorp Stadium getting flooded then we know that these cemeteries also flooded when the Brisbane River flooded particularly the 1893 flood. So it was a cemetery from 1843 to 1875 and it closed when Tawong Cemetery opened. From 1875 until 1913 it was pretty much just an abandoned cemetery. Uh, the trustees of the different, the, the different denominational trustees moved to Tawong Cemetery, and so this one was basically abandoned. Uh, and there's plenty of newspaper reports about the dilapidated condition of the cemetery. In 1913, the Ithaca Town Council, as it was then, because it was prior to the amalgamation of the, counts, of the different councils in Brisbane, which occurred in the 1920s, the Ithaca Town Council uh, applied to the state government to turn the cemetery into parkland. Uh, and that's what happened. So in 1914, it was turned into parkland. And here we can see the parkland. If you know that area, uh, running off Caxton Street down to Hale Street is Judge Street, which now terminates at Hale Street. But when they originally built the parkland, they continued Judge Street across the parkland, and that's the street we can see through the middle there. It has a small bridge over what's called the Milton Drain, and this was because this was low-lying swampy land, they, they put this uh, open-cut drain through there. That, that drain is now buried, but still functions as a drain. Okay, so you can see that all the headstones are gone. What you can see is some plantings, a cricket pitch, a small cricket pavilion. And this survived like this for six or seven years until the start of the 1920s. And then we've got a big open space close to Brisbane and nowhere to dump our garbage. So it becomes a garbage dump. It becomes the major garbage and night soil dump for Brisbane. So night soil, for those that don't know, is sewage. So Everybody had their outside dunny with a dunny can and once a week the dunny man came round and collected the contents of your dunny can into a truck and then that truck dumped its contents here along with all the garbage. This is an image taken at that time of the garbage going in. We are standing here in this photograph above the Roman Catholic Cemetery. And then in the 1940s, starting a long tradition that's continued in Brisbane, a sporting field was built over the top of the garbage dump. So this, uh, this is a running track. The Queensland Amateur Athletics Association got a uh, lease over this uh, land in the early 1940s and built this running track. And then in the 1950s, there was a big stoush between Queensland Amateur Athletics and Brisbane Rugby League which Brisbane Rugby League obviously won, and the place became a rugby league field. And this is what it looked like prior to the redevelopment. So we have the Suncorp Metway stand on one side there, and you can see the bleachers that ran at the western and again at the eastern end of the stadium. On the northern side was the um, Ron McAuliffe stand, and that's the playing field. 
So, we were involved from the very start in um, work at this stadium because we knew that these colonial cemeteries were underneath the playing field. I wrote the original cultural heritage management plan for this redevelopment and then we implemented that plan, which because the development was going to go ahead, we couldn't change the shape of the stadium. We couldn't, re we couldn't re reduce the shape of the stadium, so we knew it was going to impact these layers of, this, of the cemetery. But we didn't want to remove uh, any uh, human remains from the cemetery layers that didn't have to be removed. So the areas that we see here in, in the cross hatching are the areas that we excavated for this redevelopment. So you can see that we didn't actually uh, target all that much of the cemeteries. Uh, most people think of archaeologists using very small tools like toothpicks and dental picks and maybe little brushes and things. But this is my favourite excavation tool. This is a 22 tonne excavator and it moves a lot of earth at a time. And I, I certainly like playing with the bigger tools. We had to take off all that garbage that had built up through time and during the, um, during the garbage dump era, the 20 years of garbage dumping. And we found, obviously we found thousands and thousands and thousands of artefacts in that. But this is one of my favourites. This is a part of, part of a newspaper advertising the third birthday issue of the Australian Women's Weekly. And what this shows to me is uh, sort of in contradiction to what most people think, lots of organic material does not break down in garbage dumps and in landfills. There's been lots of historical archaeological work done showing that uh, things like paper, newspapers, don't break down when they're deposited in the archaeological record. And in fact, one of my excavators was able to find his grandfather's phone number in a telephone book that we excavated. Uh-oh. Sorry for the technical hitch, I hit the wrong button. Okay, so this is us excavating in the Roman Catholic Cemetery. And you can see the uh, fencing we put in there because we worked in conjunction with the people who were demolishing the structures on site and who were doing the redevelopment. So the uh, joint venture that was doing the redevelopment. So we were working there whilst demolition and construction activities were occurring. And so we were actually built into the critical path of the project. And what you can see here is a whole lot of white paint in rectangles on the ground surface. And this is marking out the grave shafts and you can see excavators working in the cemetery. And I'll make sure I get the right button this time. Okay, so this is in the Anglican cemetery and it shows the differences that you can see in the sediments where there are grave shafts. So in the, for, in the forefront of this picture, there are two blue dots marking uh, on yellow looking clay, which is a different color to the clay around it. There's a sort of orangey clay around it. And the reason that grave shafts stand out archeologically is because when you bury somebody in the ground, you dig through the grass, you dig through the topsoil, you dig through the subsoil, you dig through the clay, and it all goes into a big pile over there. And then you lower the coffin into the ground, and then you do not put the clay back in, and then the subsoil, and then the topsoil, and then the grass. You just shovel it all back in. And so it all gets mixed up, so it actually changes the look of the sediments. And so by changing the look of the sediments, that change then stays there permanently. And so I've excavated in seven different cemeteries in southeast Queensland, and I can, you can always find these grave shafts just by taking the top off the area. 
and then you know exactly where the grave shafts are. So this is a shot in the Ang Anglican cemetery showing three children's burials in a row. And one surprising uh, finding of this excavation of the North Brisbane burial ground was the difference between uh, the way that uh, Anglicans buried their children and the way that Catholics buried their children. The, Catholic, the Catholics buried their children in family plots, so they were buried with the adults. But in the Anglican cemetery, and this really, really surprised me, I had no idea that this was the case, what we got was rows of adults and rows of children. So uh, children and adults were not buried together in family plots. And this is, a, this is the start of a row of children's burials. Uh, in terms of uh, age, we get very similar numbers of children and adults. And this is because life expectancy in Brisbane in the 19th century was very poor. In fact, it wasn't until 1905 that you were more likely to live past five years of age than to not live past five years of age in Brisbane. This is an image from the Roman Catholic Cemetery showing three children's burials very close together. The scale in that, the red and white scale, is 25 centimetres. So if you see that, the, between two of them, there's an eight centimetre gap. So you've got to imagine that these kids were probably buried at the same time and were related to each other. Uh, this is from the Anglican Cemetery. This is a burial in the Anglican Cemetery. And what you can, you can see here, a number of the bones. That's the 25 centimetre scale in the middle again. But you can see the skull and you can see the long bones of the legs and part of the pelvis. This is uh, unusual. We didn't tend to find remains in such good condition. Most of the remains we found were like this. The 25 centimetre scale, again, but what you can see is that the 25 centimetre scale is one centimetre in diameter and is the thickest thing in this image. All the bones in this image have been very badly compressed. The scale itself is running along beside a humerus. So uh, the upper arm here, and then you can see the two bones of the lower arm. Uh, on the other side of the scale, you can see ribs and vertebra. One end of the scale, you can see the skull. And across the other side, you've got a humerus, another humerus with a little bit of trowel damage. It looks like trowel damage to the humerus. But what's happened in this case, and happened in most cases in the cemetery, was that uh, the coffin was breached shortly after burial. So what happens is gases build up in, in the coffin, and we have pressure from above from... Uh, the weight of the soil that's been put back into the grave shaft, plus we have action from roots and animals and other things, and eventually the coffin breaks, and when that happens, the lid starts to get pressed down into the coffin. And in many, many cases, we found the coffin lid and the coffin base are completely adjacent to each other. Okay, and in some cases, uh, the bone had completely disappeared. So there's a tiny bit of bone beneath the scale there. It's part of a leg bone. But what we got was uh, this dark staining in the clay. Uh, this is adipocere, otherwise known by a number of other names, and one of them is body goo. And this is what's left when the body has completely disappeared. We did get really, really lucky with one coffin. This is in the Roman Catholic Cemetery. This was our grave number 206 of the 397 that we excavated. This coffin is intact. It's completely intact. The, the lid of the coffin did not collapse, and this is the only coffin that that occurred to. The crack in the lid was caused by my 22-ton excavator. <laughs> So, unfortunately, and this is what we found when we took the lid off the coffin. You can see here 
uh, that the bones are in really, really good condition. Okay, we've got the skull at one end, and then we, down at the lower end, just below the shoulder of the coffin, you can see a couple of ribs sticking up there, and down on the other edge of the photograph, you can see half of a pelvis. All the bones are here, including the hyoid, the small U-shaped bone in the throat, which is a, one of the first to disappear. But what we see is that this coffin is full of water. And I think that's what's preserved the contents of this coffin. So the coffin has been breached at some point, but not much. And so water has seeped into the coffin over time. And archaeologically, things preserve if they're always wet or they're always dry. So if we think of the uh, mummies from the Atacama Desert in Peru that are continually dry, that never get rain, they've been preserved. If we think about the tar bodies, the bog bodies of northern Europe, they're always wet and they survive. It's when organic material gets wet and then dries out, then gets wet, then dries out, and gets attacked by fungus that it deteriorates. So I think what's happened in this situation is we had a lucky sort of juxtaposition between a small breach in the coffin, but not enough to cause the lid to collapse, and water seeping in and preserving the contents. Uh, this is a 25 to 28 year old male when they died, a Roman Catholic. We know he's a redhead because his hair was preserved. Uh, this is his lower jaw. You might think that that's hair attached to his lower jaw, but in fact it isn't. It's coconut fiber from the pillow that his head was resting on. So the uh, textile of the pillowcase has disappeared, but the coconut fiber survived. And what we can see is a really good set of teeth. <laughs> We had a forensic dentist look at the teeth and there's no tooth decay in these teeth. So this guy's got really good teeth, probably better than most 25 to 20 year olds today. Uh, he's also got a very thin jaw, as we can see, a very narrow jaw, pointed jaw. And we can see that his teeth aren't particularly ground down. So he's probably not eating all the gritty kinds of breads and things that the working class of Brisbane were eating. His coffin was the only triple lined coffin that we found. It had a mahogany exterior, then a lead liner, and then a pine interior. And it had sandalwood shavings in the base of the coffin. And sandalwood does two things. It uh, soaks up the fluids, but it also gives off a nice scent to help cover the smell of the decaying body before it's buried. So we have probably the richest, most expensive coffin in the cemetery. And I guess uh, you get what you pay for because it's the only one that survived. But this guy hadn't been lucky in life. He had fractured the top rib on the left-hand side he dislocated his right collarbone at some stage and at some point he had fractured his left thigh bone, his left femur. So what we can see here in this image is his healed femur. The break occurred about five years before he died, so when he was about 20, and we can see a seven centimetre overlap. This is a twisting fracture. So his leg's been twisted and broken. And what's happened is at the break site, the two ends are jammed up so that there's a seven centimetre overlap. And it's healed like that. So his leg is now seven centimetres shorter than it should be. And there are, you can see below the healed break, there are three spurs there they are about two centimetres long. And that's they are bony spurs that grew into his hamstring muscle. And what happened here was when the bone broke, bits of, bits of shattered bone ripped into the muscle. 
And so there were cavities in the muscle now that filled up with blood. And when the, when the bone was healing, the, the new bone that was being laid down were obviously attracted to the nutrient-rich parts where the blood was in the, was in the muscle. And so these spurs grew into the muscle. So this must have been incredibly painful. For, for this guy to walk must have been incredibly painful because he had these spurs in his muscle permanently. And I'm just going to end by showing you a picture of uh, my excavation team from the Suncorp redevelopment. So that's me sitting in the, in the bottom there with my red beard and dark hair. So you can see that it's a long time ago. And for those that, um, for those that uh, saw uh, Dr. Kevin Raines' uh, talk earlier in the week, he's the uh, second from the right in the uh, back row. So thank you very much for uh, uh, being part of my presentation on historical archaeology around uh, Queensland as part of National Archaeology Week. And I'd really like to thank the Cross River Rail crew for providing the opportunity and the facilities for doing these presentations. <laughs>